Hi, and welcome to Impossible Things with David Terra. This is episode 30, and it's actually the last episode of season one, so we've decided to go out with a bang today. Uh, and I'll get into that um, after I explain why we're called Impossible Things. Uh, it's partly because of uh, Arthur C. Clarke's third law that any um, uh, and anything that's sufficiently advanced, any technology that's sufficiently advanced, seems like magic. And partly because we like it when the White Queen in Alice Through the Looking Glass talks about doing six impossible things before breakfast. Uh, today's guest is going to talk about uh, some of the impossible things that happen in the tech industry. Uh, I've known her for a while. I've been a member of Tech UK for a long time. I used to chair their uh, software as a service group. Jacqueline de Rojas is their president and uh, She's uh, the president of the chairman of Digital Leaders and a bunch of other things. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thank you for being on today. Thank you for having me, David. I'm excited to be here to talk about impossible things. <laughs> Great stuff. Tell us, tell us a bit about, uh, about you know, uh, I know you wear several hats, so you're the president of Tech UK and you're involved in, in a number of other companies. Tell us a little bit about that. I am. So uh, I am also the co-chair of the Institute of Coding. Uh -huh. um, the, pre the president of uh, a, an amazing organization of transformation leaders called Digital Leaders. Uh, I sit on um, a number of PLC boards, uh, including Rightmove and Costain uh, and FDM Group, which is all about tech skills. And I'm a mentor at the Merrick Group. So um, I'm more of a tapas girl than a full English, I would say. I like to dip in and out of things. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent stuff, and uh, and certainly uh, one of the important things out of today is, is, is the influence you've got in the tech space. We'll talk a bit about that. But tell us a bit about what got you into the tech industry in the first place. Yeah, well, I, it was more of an accident. I'm not going to say that it was planned because my lifelong career ambition was to be a newscaster on the BBC. It was not actually to be in tech. Um, you, would been, you would have been great at that, though. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I like to I like to think that now we have so many Zoom calls and Teams calls that actually we we are all the nation's broadcasters, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah, but I I came I did a degree degree in in Germany in European business, interestingly, and I was the first in my family to go to university. But when I came back to London, I needed to pay some bills, and I was offered a job in technology recruitment, which I did for two years. And then I went to work for my largest client and and the rest is history. And I've been in the technology industry ever since. So over 30 years. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Now, I knew, I've known you for a few of those for when you've been involved in Tech UK. Um, for people that don't know what that is, t tell us what it is and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. So Tech UK is a trade body. So it's made up of member, member companies and uh, we have um, 850 plus members, very large companies. Uh, and very small companies too. Um, and we uh, exist in order to create conditions for the tech industry to thrive. And so we will help government to formulate policy and we will lobby for things like data equivalency with, um, with the EU, for example. Um, we will come together and collaborate on security and uh, yeah, a whole range of other things. We're looking at how we level up regions at the moment and create local digital capital so all things tech are on tech uk's agenda and you have uh, i mean i mean you don't have to say who but i know you're uh, you're seeing someone senior in the government tomorrow so uh, uh, hopefully you'll get your messages across for us there's a lot of a lot of interaction with with government because of course we need to make sure that technology is at the heart of policy and of um, government investment now, one of the things that I've heard you speak about passionately is kind of like a, an obvious topic, topic, which is the diversity and inclusion topic. So tell us a bit about, about why that's so important and why you're so passionate about it. Well, I, I'm so passionate about it because we still only have 17% of women in tech. And, you know, that has been the same for many, many years. And it is time that we increase that metric, not only women, actually, but also other minority voices. And the reason it matters is, you know, I suppose I could give you three reasons, David. One, one, you know, it's a noble cause. Who, who amongst us does not believe that we should all have an equal opportunity? But secondly, you know, diverse teams also make better business decisions 87% of the time, Gartner quote, I think. Um, and then the third reason it matters is because if an algorithm 
is going to decide whether you get that place at university, that job interview, that loan, then you had better make sure that the people writing that tech, creating that tech, testing that tech and implementing it are diverse. Otherwise, we will not create a world that works for everybody. You know, it's so important that we have all of our voices at the table when we're building this stuff because we're already endemically biased. And if a machine starts to learn from an already biased data set, then it will just perpetuate that at scale. It's also crucially important. And as you rightly say, there's a business case for this. It, you know, a company is actually, um, uh, they, they produce more profit, more revenue. Uh, uh, you know, they, they do a better job. If, if So why the hell, uh, you know, have we still got the fact that, you know, it's only 17% women? We haven't yeah. got balls that reflect the, 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 the society, whether it's, whether it's gender or whether it's LBGT issues or whether it's race. Why, why yeah. is it taking so long? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's because sometimes it's because it's unconscious bias. We can't see past our own privilege, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably a lot of it. You know, you there's a famous quote, isn't there, which says you can't be what you can't see. And if you don't have people who look like you in those roles, then you're not going to get people applying. But let me tell you one thing, which is that if you want to create competitive advantage in this moment of you know, arguable crisis for the country. And if you want to build back better, you're going to have to be at the front of the queue when it comes to um, looking for and retaining great talent. And people who are diverse will, will remember the companies that looked after their people and who nurtured their diversity of thought and talent teams. So I'm pretty certain that those are the people that will come out on top when it comes to digital skills and tech talent. Good to hear. Good to hear. Now, um, actually, what triggered me uh, making a call on you to do this today was actually things you were saying at, uh, on International Women's Day last week. Yeah. And this week is uh, Neurodiversity Awareness Week. So tell us a bit about neurodiversity. That's another level that, that, that we haven't got quite right yet. Yeah. So, you know, it's not just gender, it's minority voices in all its forms. Neurodiversity is such an interesting area for us in tech because you know, people who are on the um, autism spectrum, uh, Asperger's, are really, they have a superpower where they can spot trends um, that we can't see, we mere mortals can't see. And so in cyber uh, and in data analysis, people um, with those powers, superpowers, are really useful. The problem we have is that it's hard to find them. But secondly, you know, I think we, we, our tolerance levels for people who behave differently are not maybe as socially connected, possibly introverted. You know, we're not so great at that. And so, you know, I would say that perhaps the greatest threat to diversity is the belief that someone else will fix it. And actually what we all have to do is to play our part in being a little bit more tolerant when faced with someone who's a bit different from us. And that's my message on neurodiversity is just because, you know, people are not quite as outgoing, gregarious, um, don't behave like you, don't necessarily want to be as socially connected as you, but are brilliant at their roles. They have a place in our tech teams and in our teams generally. And I think that's why it matters. The, the other reason it matters is that, you know, there are, there are a lot of people who are um, in this group globally, and we should think about how we include them and how we create competitive advantage because of them. Excellent, very important. Now I'm gonna steal a, a quote that I heard you you say um, in, in, in a, a keynote uh, a year or two back. It's a quote from Alan Kay. Uh, he's an American computer scientist, is that right? That's right, and, yeah. Uh, he said, um, uh, the future cannot be predicted, but futures can be invented. So explain that, what do you mean by that? Well, I do it by example. So if you look at the last year, which has been a year like no other, it is a testament to how our economy has changed in the last decade. So, you know, just 10 years ago, many of our um, services that we use almost ubiquitously now didn't exist. Zoom, for example, was founded 10 years ago in April 2011. Um, and either they didn't exist or they weren't as advanced. And had the pandemic hit in 2011, many businesses would have had to have thought about buying servers and other hardware 
Um, but you know, because we've moved to a services model, we can get our business video conferencing and cloud computing systems in hours, in minutes, versus you know, let's go and buy all of this stuff. And and this has created the basis for a much more resilient and flexible economy. And we are really only just scratching the surface. We're really only just learning how to take advantage of that. But that's an example of how you can invent the future. And you can do it pretty quickly when a crisis happens, right? I, it, I mean, the innovation is amazing. And actually, uh, you know, many people have said that actually it's kind of kicked forward the the, the business transformation, the digital transformation of so many organisations where they just had to get, get on and do it rather than turn it into an 18 month or two year project. Yeah, digital transformation has never been faster. And necessity certainly is the mother of invention, isn't it? And, you know, I think it is really amazing that technology adoption has been so high, but it does actually mean that we have to take care of make you know the people that could be left behind people who don't have access to technology um, and people who don't have the skills to live or work online so you know i'm going to say you know 12 and a half percent of this country are in that bracket and we have to be careful that we don't run off into the future and leave that swathe of people behind yeah very important very important Another um, thing that I want to get your, your view on is that I'd actually argue that, that this last 12 months has kind of shielded uh, the Brexit that's happening underneath all of this. And, um, it, it, you know, the UK has been kind of like the tech hub of Europe for a long time now. And, and organisations, startups tend, you know, often come to, to London or the, or the UK first. What do you think Brexit will, will, will change that? Will, will it be different? What, what, do you, what do you think we should be doing? Well, I would, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball, but I'm going to give you a bit of a balanced answer here, David. And that, you know, because we are outside the EU, the single market and the customs union, it, there will for sure be additional barriers. There are mm -hmm. even for tech companies trading with the EU. So, for example, staff can now only visit you know, the EU for work or travel for up to 90 days in any 180 day period. So you know, that is a constraint and that's different from before. And so we will have to have closer management on time spent traveling overseas. However, the process of leaving the EU and the pandemic also gives us the opportunity and the obligation to look again at how we can really drive up competitiveness and innovation in the UK's tech sector. So that's probably going to be a 2021 objective and beyond. Um, but I've got no concerns because the UK remains competitive in the sense that, you know, it's a great currency, it's um, flexible time zones. Um, you know, we've got Australia in the morning and Asia, we've got Europe all day long, we've got America in the evening. You know, what's not to love about that? We've also managed to attract great tech talent to this country, so it's a hotbed for skills. Um, and also, you know, I would say that, you know, the um, regulation and the regulatory framework is probably one of the best in the world. And so there's a, a ton of reasons why, why countries would still want to invest in the UK. And of course, we attracted twice the amount of investment into innovation and tech than any other EU country uh, put together last year. So, you know, I think we do have a lot to play for. Um, we just have to make sure that we we play that, that that our cards carefully. Excellent. Good to hear. Good to hear. Now, I'm speaking to you from uh, from um, kind of Stratford West Ham in East London, and I'm, I'm a Londoner. Um, one of the complications with the tech space is that it's so London centric. Um, what should we be doing to make sure that the, that the tech ecosystems work for us also in Manchester and Leeds and Bristol and other places around the, around the country? Yeah, well, I've, I've long um, loved my hashtag, not just London, um, uh, Twitter message. And, you know, I think we can't over rely on any single place. Um, and that includes you know, not just cities either, because we've got the whole of the rural landscape, which you, know, you should be able to start up a business in a rural area as much as you, you, you can in, in, in the middle of a, of a big city. So I think we need to look at um, each region. We've done this at Tech UK. We've been right across um, 260 business and civic leaders across 
uh, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland and England. And, you know, we've got to figure out how we develop these clusters with what we're calling uh, local digital capital. And that's including digital skills, digital adoption, um, access to finance um, and all of these things that will create that momentum in the region. So I think we've got work to do. Um, but I'm very hopeful about that because I think there's a lot of people, I mean, the Treasury are, for example, moving um, out of London uh, and creating a second base, as are the security services. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for moving outside of London, not least it serves the diversity and inclusion message, doesn't it? You know, we all need to be included. It isn't just about our single um, capital city. And, and isn't this another kind of area where where what we've all experienced over the last 12 months highlights how, how that how that could work, um, you know, and actually yeah. it supports the fact that that change that change can happen. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, I think it works superbly well when everybody in the country is in lockdown because everybody's virtual. I think the challenge will come when you get those hybrid versions of you know, we've got half of the meeting virtual, half of the meeting physical. We need to make sure there are no second class citizens. So we're going to have to work out those norms and how we, you know, come back together. Um, but I am very excited that flexible working is now a thing. You know, I truly believe that work is not a place. It's where you are. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the tech industry has enabled that. And I'm very proud of that. Absolutely. Now, I, I want to circle back to something you mentioned right at the start when you, in, when you introduced yourself, which is the fact that you're involved in this coding uh, um, organization. Remind us that, what that organization is and why is, it, why is that important? Because I want to bring in the fact that, that we need to get the education going right. Yeah. So Institute of Coding, which was um, set up through um, Theresa May's government in 2018. Uh, and we, we exist in order to create widened pathways um and modular learning into technology uh, we've got over eight hundred thousand learners in two years so it's massive uh, and the take-up has been huge as you might imagine throughout the pandemic lots of people have wanted to pivot into tech from displaced roles elsewhere um and particularly lots of women which is heartening because yeah. you know they've been disproportionately affected by by covid19 and the pandemic what, how do you think we should be changing our education curriculum to, to actually support the, the, the digital economy, economy that we need? What, what, are we, what are we getting wrong? What should we be doing instead? So I'd like to see education, the curriculum, um, really bring in technology at a much younger age. Yeah. You know, I look at other countries, you, you look at China, I mean, age four, they are already you know, learning about AI and, and what have you. And I, I am heartened. I mean, I also work as an ambassador for the Girl Guiding Association. And there they have STEM badges where they learn about a staying safe online uh, badge. They've got an AI badge. They've got a security badge. It's just so cool. And that's voluntary. And I think we should also encourage young children to, to, to you know, to get some joy out of technology and, and but how to navigate uh, the consumption of tech safely as well. Is any of that going to come into, I mean, you may not be able to say very much about this, but, but I know you're speaking to government tomorrow. Is that is any of that going to come into what you're recommending that, that, that you do differently tomorrow? That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I think what we do at Tech UK is to make sure um, that we lobby um, for um, the skills and talent pool to, uh, to be invested in and to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to consistent learning and education in technology across the country. So, yes, I mean, I hope uh, that we will get more, not less. Excellent. Two, two, two kind of uh, slightly uh, interesting questions. One's to do with creativity. Um, do you think that, that there is enough uh, kind of uh, emphasis put behind the idea of different thinking skills in, in our education system? Well, critical thinking is so important, isn't it? And learning how to problem solve is super important. I would argue that, you know, one of the reasons that we don't get women into the tech sector is because we use um, scary words like software engineer, which sound quite male. And you could, you know, instead of saying software engineer, you could you could exchange that for problem solver. Yeah. Um, 
And I actually think, you know, if we started to do that and then we taught it in a way which was much more accessible, I think we would get a lot more diversity and diverse talent wanting to learn about the creative side of tech. And can I just say that STEM should actually be STEAM, shouldn't it? So it should be science, technology, engineering, arts and maths, because that creative part of STEM, STEAM, is so important. We still need to have, you know, the creative side inside programming and how we build our businesses. Now, um, uh, obviously, he's, he's gone now, but my favourite TED Talk, um, probably everyone's favourite TED Talk, because it's the most watched, is the Sir Ken Robinson one, talking about exactly that that topic and how the hierarchy of education is all wrong. Yeah. Um, so, so you'd su definitely support the idea of, of, of um, adding design thinking in, 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 into the curriculum and, and, and as a means of supporting that. Yes, I, I definitely do, because critical thinking, sideways thinking, you know, not necessarily building tech because someone's asked you, but building tech because you're solving a problem that really matters and being able to get your head around a problem that really matters is, is quite interesting. You know, I, I was um, thinking about when the London Underground was um, overwhelmed with tourism and they were, they were trying to figure out how to get more people through the London Underground and not create all these queues. And once one person said, let's get faster ticket machines. Another person said, let's figure out how we close stations at certain times. The genius in the room said, well, I think the real problem is how do we get people through the barriers without breaking a stride? Now that is so smart. And that's where tap and go technology comes in. And it's not even new technology, but the genius in the room is the person that says, you're not solving the right problem. This is the problem. And yeah. that's where critical thinking and design thinking comes in. And, and it's it's also putting the, the, the customer at the heart of it. That, that, that's where it starts. Yeah. Well, and that's, the, you know, that's where automation, you know, and what robots can do is really exciting on one side. But actually what it does is it frees up all of our time so we can go and talk to the customer and hear what they need. And that's that's where the human and side and soft skills will really start to come in. With your tracking back through your history in tech, you, you've been around in, in the space a while like I have. Um, do you agree that, that now is the most exciting time because we've actually got so many different innovations and, and, and emerging technologies happening simultaneously? I think it is very exciting. They are happening simultaneously, but they are happening really fast. And the pandemic has accelerated that. You know, it's so interesting how much investment is going into technology, maybe because companies are now having to be more efficient because, you know, they're struggling a bit. Yeah. Um, and that life online has just flipped like a switch. So, you know, I think that we are at running at a terrifying pace. And we need to make sure that we take the ethics with us, um, yeah. that we get data privacy right, and that we create secure environments so that we create a safe place to work and live online. Yeah, very important, very important messages. Well, th thinking about about the, the, you know the twelve months that we've just just gone through, it seems amazing to me that that twelve you know, twelve months ago was just the time when when you know before lockdown had had been announced, and we were all beginning to realise this thing was serious. But now we're coming into a new phase where where things are going to be opened up a bit more. What advice have you got for for people in the tech space and and, and business leaders as to what they should be thinking about in this next phase? Yeah, I think from a business leadership perspective, I would say, you know, just check that the plan that you had before the pandemic hit is still the plan that you need post pandemic. Because, you know, a great friend of mine and colleague, Margaret Heffernan, she's got this fabulous uh, analogy, which is about making Moussaka, which is your business plan. So if you were making Moussaka, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and now you haven't got lamb but you've got beef you haven't got olive oil but you've got white wine you haven't got garlic so you substitute it for for um uh i don't know celery and you still believe you're going to to make moussaka then you know think again because maybe you want to be in the other gang the diverse gang which is the fridge gang and they're going to the fridge and saying well what have we got because yeah. the, you know if you go there and you're much likely to create a plan um, which will optimize your resources um, versus try and create something that you don't have. Now it's very, very important that we concentrate on on on, the, on making a nice meal rather than the particular. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't stick to the plan because you want to feel that you're 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 sticking to normality. You know, create a plan that's going to work moving forward, not looking backwards. 
Excellent. No, I, I'm a big proponent of the military thinking where, where you know, no plan uh, uh, survives uh, contact with the enemy. So, so you have to do that all the time. So. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Any any kind of uh, thoughts you want to leave our audience with in terms of in terms of uh, uh, you know some of the things we talked about, like like uh, what should they be thinking about in terms of education and and STEM and all that sort of thing? Any, any final thoughts for us? Well, I mean, STEM and technology, it, it it's no longer a nice to have. It's going to be central to every business, and you know the skills that we all need to work and live online will be very tech centric. Ninety percent of all jobs will have a tech element to them, so. You know, be mindful of that. Skill up your people and continue to upskill them. Lifelong learning really matters. Ah, oh, good thing. Lifelong learning. That's that's a good extra extra thing to chip in. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, we wish you luck at Downing Street tomorrow and uh, or wherever you're meeting, whoever it is you're meeting. And uh, um, good luck. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Excellent. That was great to hear hear uh, Jacqueline's. Uh, vision for uh, the way the tech industry needs to move and, and, and uh, some of the issues around diversity and inclusion, really important stuff in there. Um, it's a great way to end the series. Uh, Impossible Things will be back in a series two. Um, it will be uh, it will be different. We'll be uh, using some uh, interesting disruptive uh, live technology around mixed reality. So it's going to be different from the way it was and we're looking forward to, to what might happen next. If you want more content like this uh, i'm at dt on twitter uh check out at disruptive live on twitter uh, and disruptive live on linkedin um if you follow hashtag um impossible things and look out for impossible things.fyi there'll be more like this see you for series two thanks <laughs>